it's Ken Finnan, and I'm here to help you pass the Series 7, the SAE exam, the Series 65, the 66, and on the Series 6. So back to this, the longest, boringest, most valuable videos I can do, because I'm just going to go through the financial terms. So this way, when you hear something, you go, oh, I know what that is. You may not be able to answer the question, but you should know what it is. Okay, we're up to M now. M is in Mary. M is in Mahogany. M is in, I'm my, don't know. So let's start with this. M, M1. Okay, M1 is the basic money supply. Okay, it's it's all the currency in circulation plus like checking accounts. Okay, that's M1. M2 is that plus on-demand deposit, savings accounts, stuff like that. So M1 is the most fluid, most liquid. M2 is that plus savings accounts. Okay, makers, M-A-C-E-R, M-A-C-R-S. So we, we, you're allowed to depreciate certain assets. So normally you do a straight line depreciation. If you have a $100,000 car and it's 10 years before it, the average life of it, according to the IRS, is 10 years, you would take, you could write off $10,000 a year in depreciation. That's straight line. Uh, accelerated or makers, which probably won't be on the exam, but it's good to understand it, means you're going to take more in the beginning. Like maybe instead of taking 10 grand a year, you take 20 grand for the first couple of years like maybe three years, and then you then you divide the last six into like six years or sixty grand. I can't do math, so let's let's start over. Okay, makers, modified accelerated cost recovery system. That's fancy for depreciation, but normal depreciation is straight line. If you have a hundred thousand dollar truck, you get to write off that it's losing in value every year. So the IRS says, let's say it has a ten year lifespan. They'll let you write off your hundred thousand dollar truck over the ten years which means you get to deduct 10 grand a year. Boom, boom, boom. That's regular straight line um, depreciation. I want to say accretion, but it's depreciation. Now, accelerated means instead of taking 10 grand a year, you're going to take more in the beginning, like maybe 20 grand for the first two years, and then spread the last 60 grand over the next eight years. So you're going to take more deductions in the beginning and less at the end. So you'll have less taxable income in the first couple of years, but more in the end. And the reason they do that is because they go with, well, money now is worth more than money later. So I'd rather have the deductions now than later. So that's makers, M-A-C-R-S. Okay. Maintenance. Okay. Maintenance for, um, that's not like fixing in you know, a car and stuff like that. Maintenance is the minimum amount of equity you can have in a margin. Again. Remember, I know we talk about it later, but margin, just do it now, do the whole thing. Margin, a margin account is when you have an account that you're allowed to borrow money. You can leverage, you can borrow money to buy more shares. Instead of a cash account, like a cash account, you have to come up with 100% of whatever you're buying. A margin account, you can do less. And there's ways that you can do less than 50%, but we're just going to stick with for this test. Reg T covers margin, and it says that you have to deposit 50%, and you should have 50% equity in your account all the time. So if you buy 10,000 in stock, stock, you buy 10,000 in stock, you should put down five grand. Can't really put that less than that. Now that's margin. Okay. A margin, a main, a margin call is when you buy the shares and they say you have to put up the money. Or if you go below minimum maintenance, you have to put up some money. So maintenance on the long account. If you have a long margin account where we're buying shares, 50% is right T. But if the stock goes bad and your equity starts dropping, your equity can't fall below 25%. So again, your equity can't fall below 25% equity. So it's 25% of the market value. If it does, then they're going to give you a maintenance or margin call and tell you to put up some more money. On the short side, your equity can't fall below 30%. Okay. So again, on the short side, your equity can't fall below 30% of the market value, or you will have to um, come up with some money. Okay, market maker, market maker. What's a market maker? A market maker is a firm, a broker dealer member, FINRA member firm. That's their job. Their, or really, their main job is to make a market in the securities. Wow, circular definition. That doesn't help me at all, Ken. So a market maker is someone who has to be willing to buy and sell shares all the time. And they don't have to just be willing. They have to be out there saying, I'll buy shares at this price and I'll sell shares at this price. They have to have an active bid and offer at all, two-sided market, a bid and offer at all times, Minimum of 100 shares. Well, that's NASDAQ. On the on the over-the-counters, they just have to have a, they should have a quote somewhere in there. They don't have to, but they should. So market makers buy and sell. They make bids, they make offers, and that creates the liquidity by, on the NASDAQ, if they have to be there from 930 to 4 every day, 
then by having multiple market makers, two, three, you know, make 20 or 30 market makers, maybe more in a stock, that creates a market where there's a bunch of buyers and a bunch of sellers. And that's what happens. Now, let's jump on this a little bit. So if you're a market maker, what you're going to do is you're going to buy at the bid and sell at the offer if you can. And if you buy at the bid, you're going to charge your customer a markdown. They go to hit your bid. They sell it at your price. You're going to charge them. You're going to pay them a little bit less. So if you're bidding 50 bucks, you're going to pay them 49.50. Maybe. So you're charging a 50 cent markdown. That's your commission. That's your profit. If they're buying from your offer, say you're offering it at 51 and they buy it from you at 51, they're buying it from you. Remember, as a broker, you're a middleman. This one, you're actually the other side of the trade. You're selling it to them. So you sell it to them at 51, but then you really charge a 50 cent markup. So you're actually selling it to them at 51.50, charging a 50 cent markup. So market makers make markets. They buy and sell all day long. They're supposed to be there all day long. That's their job. They trade. They are making, they're doing everything principally, PDM, principal dealer market, markup. So if a customer buys, they charge a markup. If the customer sells, they charge a markdown. Okay, management company. What's a management company? So under the investment company at the 40, there's three things. F, face amount certificates, U, unit investment trust, and M, management companies. That's like mutual funds, closed-end funds, ETFs. They're pooled investment and they have a manager. And the manager actually charges a manager fee. And that's that's part of your expense ratio. So kill two birds with one stone. Management company is an investment company that has, that has a portfolio of securities and they trade them. They can be active or passive or whatever. And the more passive they are, the less the fees, the less the management fees are. The more active they are, the more the management fees are. So if you have a closed-end fund or open-end fund that's actively managed, there'll be real management fees. If you have like an index fund or an ETF or even a fund that's passively managed, the management fees will be lower. Not to be, that management fee is what you pay the investment advisor, portfolio manager for managing portfolio. Not to be confused with the manager's fee. Oh God, the manager's fee is for an underwriter, right? So the lead underwriter, that's another one. The managing underwriter will charge a, um, will, will basically make some money. They'll, let me do this one. The lead underwriter, the managing underwriter, that's an M, will be the, the book writer. They're the one who cuts the deal with the firm wanting to sell shares. They sign the underwriting agreement. They they may buy all the shares and then run the show and then bring in the syndicate members, okay? And they make the manager's fee, which is really the difference between what they pay the issuer and then they sell to the syndicate. So if I'm going to pay the issuer $18 a share and then I sell it to the, to the rest of the syndicate at $18.25, right? That's going to be a 25 cent manager's fee. That's fine. That's the way we do it. That, that's easier than saying, hey, just sell it and cut me a check. I'm going to buy the shares at 18 sell them to the rest of the syndicate at 18, 1825, and then the syndicate will sell them to the public. So that's the managing underwriter runs the show and they make the manager's fee. Again, not to be confused with management fee, which is for a mutual fund or a management company that pays the manager who manages it. Okay. Marginal tax rate. Marginal tax rate is the, do, is the last marginal tax rate is the, the tax on the last dollar you earn. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? So what happens is, sorry. Oh, okay, so these are ballpark tax rates. So the first, the first 11, let's say you make 100, grand, okay? The first 11 grand you earn, you're gonna pay 10%. From 11 to 44 and change, you're going to pay 12. From 44 to 95, you're going to pay 22%. And anything above 95 up to like 180 or so is going to be 24%. So you're not paying 24. If you're in the 25% bracket, you're not paying 24% of everything. It's some mix of this. So actually, when you do the math on this, which I'm not going to do, that's what they call the effective tax bracket. Your marginal is this. So if you make 100 grand, your marginal is your top tax bracket. So when they're trying to figure out, oh, you do an investment, and what do you pay taxes on? It's going to be this rate. Because remember, anything you make is going to be on top of the 100, all the way up to 180. So everything from 95,000 to 180 is going to be taxed at 24%. And that's your marginal tax bracket. That's not what you're paying on everything. And your effective is obviously going to be lower than that. But that is your top tax bracket. And anything you earn on top of the 100 grand through investments and stuff, if it's ordinary income, will be taxed at this 24%. Or if you're over in 180, it'll be 32%. Again, these are ballpark numbers, but that's the idea that a marginal tax bracket is your top tax bracket. It's not what you're actually paying in total. It's just what you're paying on the last, they call it the last dollar you earn. Market cap. 
Market cap is really just how big the company is. They're not going to make you memorize the thing, so I'm not going to waste your time with it. But like they have large cap, mid cap, small cap, micro cap, nano cap. So it's all, all it really is is the outstanding shares. Remember, outstanding, not issued, not authorized. Outstanding shares times the market price. Again, market price times the outstanding shares. That is market capitalization. And if the stock goes up, if the stock goes up a lot, you become a bigger company maybe. Like um, Apple, I think, is over a trillion, and it's really just the number of shares times the market price. And if the market price were to drop, it would go back under a trillion maybe, or higher, it would be more. So it's all market cap is specifically outstanding shares times the market price, and it changes every day. Okay, market risk. Okay, market risk is the risk that you're going to lose your money. Yeah, it's called systematic risk. Okay, it's that the whole market drops. Okay, so if you have market risk and the whole market drops, okay, and then yours is going to go down. So let's use the banking crisis from a few weeks ago that the, the banks were, there was a bank run, everyone's worried. So what happened? All the stocks went down. Every stock, even not banking stocks, everything, tech, everything went down. And there's not much you can do about it. I mean, you can buy index puts, but as far as diversification, you can't diversify your way from market risk. You can against business or non-systematic, but market risk and system, slash systematic risk, you cannot diversify that away. That is just not a thing. You can, Again, you can buy index puts to protect it, but market risk is like, what if the whole market going down big, like March 13th, 2020, the market was down what eight, 900 points, if not more, no matter what you own, you will lose money. That's market. market order as opposed to a limit order, a market order. Well, let's do a limit order first. A limit order, even though it's not an M, a limit order is when you offer to buy something or sell something and you give a price. They're not going to say, take a limit order. They're just going to say, oh, buy the shares at 40 or sell the shares at 40, which means if I give you an order to buy shares at 40, you are not paying more than 40. You will not do that. And if I give you an order to sell shares at 40 or 30, you're not going to, um, you're not going to sell them below that. That's a limit order. Okay. On the second side, a market order, a market order is the order to buy shares. Okay. And I'm, oh, buy shares or sell shares. And I'm, I'm not giving you a price. Just buy them at the best available, the next price. If it's at 42, it's at 42. If it's at 4210, it's 4210. I care about price because I'm not an idiot. But I'm not worried about it. I just want you to buy it because I'm more. It's more important for me to get the shares or sell them than to worry about every little nickel. So again, a market order means I'm giving you an order to buy or sell at the next available price, executed immediately. Unless they say not held, and then you can wait. But we'll get to that. Okay, a market out clause. A market out clause is basically if I'm an underwriter, I sign the agreement. I'll have some certain parameters in there that if something hits the fan, you know what that means. Um, you will, we can get out of the deal. We can cancel it or postpone it or whatever it is. Certain things that make it impossible to sell. Like maybe the CEO was caught with fraud or the CEO we were caught borrowing too much money, stuff like that. Or, or COVID hit some event or something that happens that gives us the ability to back out of the deal. That's all. That's what a market out clause is. Okay, let's talk about manipulation. Manipulation is when you uh, try to fraudulently move the market for your benefit, okay? So manipulation is when you try to move the market for your benefit, you either try to get people to buy or sell or move it or do something, but you're lying, defrauding. You're not just giving an opinion. You're saying you're lying, committing an act, things like matched orders. What are matched orders? It's where you, say you and me, or you have two accounts and you place a buy and a sell at the same time, literally identical pretty much, and have them actually, you send them to the floor or onto the market at the same time, and you know they're going to execute against each other to create volume and make people think of a certain price. Maybe you have them go up in price or something like that. So it makes people think that there's something going on there when there isn't. It's lying, it's fraud, it's stealing, it's criminal. That's a matched order. Okay, That goes along with manipulation. Mark in the open and mark in the close is similar. That mark in the open or mark in the close is placing orders before, right before the close or the open to make it open or close at a certain price. So mark in the open is placing a bunch of orders to buy or sell to make the price close at a certain close at a certain price, or if it's an open, open at a certain price. Again, it's manipulation and it's not open. Okay, market price. Market price is the last reported price of a stock or a bond. Basically, where it's trading. If somebody says where's what is it trading at, that's the last sale. That's the market price, whatever it is. It's trading in the secondary market has a market price. That's it. Now, mark to market is the way of valuing. A stock is how you value a stock or a security or an asset based on the last reported trade or where it closed. That's the market value of something. 
to determine what the value is. And the reason it's important is a lot of things, but the one that's going to be on the exam is more about they're just, you're using mark to market to determine if you have to come up with more money for margin, whether you're short or long or whatever, if, or if an option, it's futures, it's all this stuff, but it's used to determine if your va the value of your security is too low where you would need to put up more money. That's what mark to market is. They do it on like a daily basis. They check your prices and then they check it to see against what your contract is, whether you owe money or not, and to decide if you need um, to put up more money. Sometimes people use it for profit and loss. When I was early on, we do mark to market every day to check our positions to see if we made money on a given day or not. We don't know taxes on it because it's unrealized, but it was an idea of, oh, up for 3% today. We're down 3%. We do all our portfolio, all our securities, compare them to the day before. It was on paper. It was a pain in the ass. And I suck at that shit. And we would just figure it out. And that's mark to market every day, checking out the price. Material information. Okay. So there's material and immaterial or non-material. Material is an information that's important for a person or an investor or anyone to make a decision on whether to buy or sell. So material information is stuff that is important. So if you are making a recommendation, you should disclose all material information that you know, that you that would help them decide to make a decision on whether to buy or sell. Immaterial, it's not a big deal. I mean, so material would be like if we have a merger or takeover or in trouble or we, you know, maybe started a new business line or something like that. Immaterial is like, oh, one of our subsidiaries moved from Broad Street to Main Street. Who cares? right? Stuff like that. So, or we have a new manager in one of our warehouses of a subsidiary or something, something so far down the line, it doesn't really matter. And that's where the whole insider information thing comes in. They call it MNPI, material non-public information. So like if you're in possession of immaterial information, who cares what you do? Because it's not, doesn't matter, right? But material non-public information means it's non-public private inside information that matters that would make a difference. So having that, having that in possession isn't the crime. It's the acting on that information. So if insider trading is based on, if you have the information, it is what it is. But if you trade on it or act on it or tell other people about it, that's where the problem is. But again, if you tell people material information and they don't do anything, you don't have a problem. But once you say this to something to someone, you can't control it anymore. So keep that in mind. Okay. And what happens if you do become in possession of material non-public information? You should tell your supervisor or compliance department and let the, or a principal and ask them what you should do. A married put. So a married put is when you buy stock and buy a put the same day. Okay. A married put is when you buy stock and buy a put on the same day. And why you do that is that if you have a, um, if you buy a married put, the break even or your cost basis will be impacted by the, by what you pay. And it's considered one position. If you do it on the same day, it's one position. And the good thing is if you buy stock today and you buy a put on the same day, your holding period, which you want to be over a year to get a lower tax bracket, continues on with no problem. But if you buy a put after the day, say you buy it today, you buy the stock today, and you buy the put in a week. Well, you've held this a week, week. You've held the stock for a week now, but if once you buy that put, it goes back to zero and stays at zero, your holding period, until you get rid of the put. Why that matters is you want to hold it for over a year and a, a year and a day, and then you get long-term status, which is a lower tax bracket. That's not going to happen if you buy the put. It's going to take a longer time. So if you buy a put, if you buy stock and then buy a put nine months later, well, your nine month of holding time is now put down to zero. And then when you get back, when you sell the put or let it expire, it, it starts up at one again. So you could really extend your time. So the two times that you can buy a put and not have a problem. If it's a married put, you buy it on the same day. Or if you wait till after you've held it for one year and a day, over a year, then there's no problem. Maturity date. This is for fixed income usually. Not preferred, not common. Maturity date is for bonds, like notes, bills, bonds, stuff like that. Any kind of muni note, any kind of muni bond, corporate bond, treasuries. They don't last forever. So there's a maturity date. That's the day the principal gets paid back. That's what it is. A maturity date is a day the principal gets paid back and the issuer no longer owes the money. That's it. That's a maturity date. Okay. Mean. We're going to go through the three of them. Mean, median, and mode. They're all M's, but they're not all together. Mean is the average. That's you, you, add, you take all your numbers, you add them up, and then divide by the number, and you get mean. I'm not going to do the math. You should be able to do mean. That's average. Median is the same amount above and below. It's like the middle. It's the same amount of things above and below. That's the median. And mode is how many times a number shows up. So if you have a bunch of numbers, the number that shows up the most, if there is one, 
is called mode. So again, mean is average, median is the middle, and mode is what shows up the most. Modern portfolio theory is a method of diversifying and reducing risk and increasing your portfolio, looking for an optimal portfolio. But what you're looking at, you're not looking at each security on its own. When you have to, you have to make sure that's suitable. We also have to look at the portfolio as a whole and look at that and how they work together. Like you want to diversify. You don't want to have all muni bonds, right? Because then you have all interest rate risk and inflation risk. So you want to diversify your portfolio. To, so you're going to look at the entire portfolio to determine the risk, okay? And that's what you're looking for. Instead of looking at one security's risk, you look at how the relationship between all the securities together creates a level of risk. That's modern portfolio. Mediation. So mediation is when they have you sit in a room and they all have a little peace person in the middle, like a FINRA arbitrator who sits there and basically you're going to hash it out and they're going to make sure you don't kill each other. That's the whole point of it. The mediator goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, they try to keep, they try to mediate it and keep you in the middle. They don't have any control over it. Their job is just really to be in the middle and make sure that everyone gets to hear their say and stuff like that. And mediation is not binding until you sign. Okay. When you sign the contract to say, oh, we come to a meeting of the minds, we sign and boom, we will get, um, then it's binding. But until then you can walk away at any time. It's usually a precursor to arbitration. So you file for a complaint, you want to work it out. You're going to file an arbitration complaint. They're going to send you to mediation first to try to get you to do that. Then after that, if that doesn't work, you go to arbitration. A member order is where um, a member order usually comes after all customer orders, right? A member order, there's a whole muni one, but I don't think we're going to go there. A member order is when a friend or member wants to buy or sell shares. They take the back seat. So if there's a cu public customer order in, in the, in the um, I'm stuttering, in the book or something, and it's out there, it'll the customer order will be filled first, then the member order, because they have to come last. Member orders come last. What's a merger? A merger is when two companies come together, okay? There's a lot of insider trading stuff with that, like people worried about that. That's where it usually happens. But it's like if, you know, when a one company merges with another, like T-Mobile and Sprint getting together, and they go through a whole rigmarole. They have to go through a lot of um, federal laws to make, federal agencies to make sure that they're not, creating a monopoly. Like if Coke and Pepsi went together or say AT&T and Verizon merged, that would cause a problem because that would make, that would give a monopoly pretty much of the whole market. So they would probably kill that. But that's a merger is when two companies come together as opposed to a takeover when one company buys all the shares of another, like a tender offer, which we'll get to when we get to the T's. Member firm, I think I've said this a few times, a member firm is a broker dealer that is registered with FINRA. That is a member of FINRA. They're registered with FINRA they're subject to FINRA's rules. Okay, what's the mill rate? The mill rate, let's get into it. So the mill rate is what each town sets their own mill rate, and that's how they decide what to charge you on property taxes. And the books all do this 0.01% shit. It's so much easier than this. When if God forbid you have to figure it out, you most likely won't, but it's super easy. All you're going to do is this is the mill rate. This is how you're going to figure it out. Each town has your own, whatever. So you're going to use this to figure out what you owe in taxes. All you're going to do now, you don't do market value. I, market value is not the one we use. We use assessed value. That's if you live in a house every like 10 years, the town comes in, counts all your rooms. They, they have some new person count the rooms, count, see how big the house is, how the land is, and come out and then change your taxes and say you owe us more money. They're assessing it. So it's usually never the same as market value. But let's say it's assessed value of 300000 And you go, wow, the mill rate is four, which is 0. 0.0004. That's so hard to do. So I just do this. I take off the last three zeros and then multiply. It's the easiest way to do it. So four times 300 is 1,200. So in this case, I would owe 1,200 a year in property taxes. It's that simple. So again, all you're doing is taking off the last three zeros of the assessed, not market value, last three zeros of the assessed value, whatever it is, whether it's 30 million or 300,000 or four grand or whatever it is, take the last three zeros off and then multiply times the mill rate, four times 300, $1,200, super easy. A mini max offering. Okay, so a mini max offering is a type of offering which is going to be a best efforts, which means the best efforts is um, best efforts is where we're going to do an offering, try to sell shares, try to sell as many as we can. But there's two types of contingent ones. There's an all or none, which means you either sell the entire issue or none at all. Like say I go to sell a million shares, I go to I say either sell the million or don't bother at all, or I do a mini max and go low. Here's a minimum. You want to I want a million shares sold, but if you get to 600 grand, we're good to go. So if you don't get to the 600, we cancel the deal. So on a mini max, we want to get to a number. And then once we're at that number, we'll try to get the rest. 
but we got to get to that first number or the deal is canceled. That's what best efforts is. Any max is part of best efforts. Okay, monetary policy, that's where the Federal Reserve comes in and tries to, they, monetarist policy and monetary policy believes that if you impact the money supply, monetary, you can impact the economy. That's what's going on now. They're raising the rate, like they're trying right, right now, it's 2023 in case you watch this in 20 years when I'm long dead. Um, monetary policy is the Federal Reserve is trying to shut down, slow down hyperinflation. So they're raising rates and selling treasuries and stuff like that. So they're trying to affect the money supply to make it harder to borrow. And during contraction, they will try to inc increase the money supply to make it easier to borrow. So that's money supply that they believe that they're trying to um, use the money supply to control the economy. That's not fiscal. Fiscal would be if the government's doing it through taxes and legislations and spending. So monetary policy is basically moving the money amount, changing the level of money in the economy to either slow down or speed up the economy. That's monetary policy. What's a money market? A money market is basically short-term debt, usually a year or less. I think you can go to 13 months. I keep seeing questions on that, but it's really like commercial papers, T-bills, bankers' acceptances, CDOs, re CDO, CDs, sorry, CDs, repos, federal funds, stuff like that, all short-term stuff a year or less, short-term debt a year or less. Long-term bonds are not, common stock is not, preferred is not, anything like equity would not be a money market. The money market fund is a mutual fund that pretty much that just invests in short term debt. It's basically um, it's it's earn interest without having any risk. It's where you park your money kind of thing, because individual retail, individual retail customers don't really buy money markets. They'll buy money market funds. It's easier that way. Big companies who need to park their money will buy money markets, but retail will buy money market funds. And unless they've changed it, the NAV is always going to be a dollar. And usually like you, that's like. It's like a checking account. Sometimes you can write checks against the money. You don't have you don't have to put a lot of money in stuff like that. It's almost like a checking account with a better return. And the money supplies that M one M two stuff that I talked about earlier, Monte Carlo simulation. That's basically what we're doing is we're looking we're throwing a bunch of scenarios at a portfolio. We're running a bunch of simulations at a portfolio to determine how much it'll go up versus down, and that's how we kind of get standard deviation. This we're looking at. We're throwing all these scenarios at the portfolio to see. We're doing like a stress test in a way. We're seeing if what it will go up or down based on the different scenarios. So that's Monte Carlo simulation. Moody's, Moody's and S&P, they do credit ratings, right? So Moody's basically does a, um, God, I say basically way too, basically I say basically way too many basically times. Okay, so Moody's and S&P, they do the credit ratings. That's what they do. AAA or AAA is the top. Triple B or BAA is the lowest investment grade. Double B or BA, they're similar are the highest speculative rates. So that's what Moody's, Moody's is that, and so is S&P and Fitch. What's well, a moral obligation bond? A moral, ob I guess God, the sun just hit me. So it's like, ooh, I'm like fading away. Okay, now, moral obligation bond. Okay, moral obligation bond is a bond that is a, it's kind of like a um, double barrel in a little bit. It's a revenue bond, okay, it's a revenue bond, but they also, if they run out of money, which they normally don't do, if they run low on money and they can't pay their debt service, they will reach out to the town and the senators or whatever you want to call it, the trustees, whatever you want to call it, the council members will vote on whether they pay it or not. And they don't have to. It's a moral obligation. They don't have to make it up. They can if they want to. So they can say no. As opposed to a double barrel, which is a revenue bond first, but it's with a G, I call it a revenue bond with a geo kicker. So it's like if there's a hospital, you can't let it fail. So if there's not enough money, which has never happened with the hospital, um, if there's not enough money, then they will just take the ed, take some of the ad valorem taxes to pay the debt service on that. So double barrel is where they have to. Moral obligation is they just they get to if they want to, but they can say no. The town can say no, we can't afford it. It's a mortgage bond. A mortgage bond is there, it's not a mortgage backed security. Remember that mortgage backed security is is basically looking at cash flows, flows from people paying the mortgages and you're, you're getting a part of it. That's not this. And there's prepayment risk and all that. A mortgage bond is a bond that is backed by property. So we have debentures, which are unsecured bonds. Then we have secured bonds, which are mortgage bonds. Mortgage bonds, like you issue a bond and say, listen, lend me the money. And then if I, if I default, I'll sell my property to pay you. That's a mortgage bond. Okay, good. Another tool of the Fed is moral suasion, moral suasion, kind of like persuasion without the PER. So it's when like Jerome Powell, the current um, Fed chair, 
after he decides to change the rates, they give a speech and they go, oh, he goes out there and does a does a barnstorm. He goes, oh, the banking crisis is over or we're looking at more pain in the future. Sometimes that affects, okay, that affects the economy a little bit because you can watch them. You can see the markets up and then he says something like, oh, we're, it's going to be a lot of pain. The market drops. It does. It affects the money supply. It impacts people's reactions so that not only do they vote to raise the rate or lower the rate and buy or sell treasuries, they use moral suasion to give you an idea of what they're looking at to decide what they're going to do in the future. So you can react. Just to get back into it, a mortgage-backed security kind of CMO is where you're buying a product that, it, that represents an income stream from people paying the mortgages. So they pool these mortgages and that people pay into the mortgages and you're buying this pooled investment of it. And you're, each month, you're going to get a little bit of interest and a little bit of principal. Your biggest risk on a mortgage-backed security is usually not default risk because mortgages really don't do that especially Ginny Mae mortgages, but prepayment risk. And if rates go down, what do people do? People refinance, right? So mortgage-backed security, the biggest risk really is prepayment risk. And as rates go down, people are going to refinance, which means they're going to pay off the one that you're getting paid on and borrow from somewhere else to get a lower rate. And now you're getting less money. Because remember, the thing about a mortgage-backed security is unlike a bond where you get a lump sum at the end, here you're getting a little bit of an interest and principal every single month. So over the 25 or 30 years, you're going to get all your money back as you go along, not in one lump sum. What's a moving average? A moving average is like you take, you plot all the prices over time, and then you look at the average price over the time, like the 60 day, 90 day, 120, 180. You're looking at the average prices and you, you plot the line so you can see like a trend up and down. Technical traders use that. Okay. A multiple, multiple is just like what they call the PE ratio. This is front of fundamental. I like how it goes both ways. PE ratio is a multiple. P ratio, which is a multiple, that's a code word for it, okay, slang, is how many times the market price is trading over the earnings. So price, PE is price divided by earnings, right? So that's the multiple, price divided by earnings, okay? And that's called the multiple. So if you have a growth stock, it's like 30, 40 times earnings. That's a multiple of the earnings, okay? So again, it's price divided by earnings. So that's the multiple or the PE ratio. Municipal bond is a bond issued by a city, town, state. And the big advantage of that is that it should be the interest should be tax free. Capital gains are never tax free, but the interest should be tax free. Who buys them? Rich people buy them. If it's a GO, it's it's for stuff that's free to use and it's backed by taxes. It's non self supporting. A revenue is for stuff that costs you money, like hospitals, tolls, stuff like that. And, and the money from people paying the tolls and the fees and the rents and all that cover the debt service. That's the difference in geos and revenues. Those are both muni bonds. Rich people buy munis, poor people buy corporates, limps buy treasuries. And a muni bond fund is just a mutual fund that just buys, just buys muni bonds. Boom. And let's throw it in here. So it's usually a mutual fund that buys muni bonds and it has the same kind of, um, it's trying to find federal tax exempt stuff. So make sure we're clear. Muni bonds do not pay federal tax on the interest. You might pay state or local if you buy from another state, but muni bond funds Usually, they, they, the interest you're getting is not going to be taxable. A muni note is a short-term muni bond. Tans, rands, bands, you can look that shit up, but they're short-term muni bonds. MSRB, all they do is write the rules. They do not enforce. MSRB is Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. They write the rules for munis, not for the issuers, but for the dealers, but they don't, they don't enforce them. The last, mutual, the last M is mutual fund. A mutual fund is an investment company. It's a pooled investment, open end. We have a whole videos on that, so you should know this. A mutual fund is a pooled investment that hopefully diversifies your portfolio. So you buy it for the management, you buy it for the liquidity, and you buy it for the, diver for the diversification. And you buy it at NAV plus a sales charge, and you sell it at NAV, and it's priced once a day. You should know what this is. That's M's. Hopefully, I'll get to M's.